Firefoxes is a group of ordinary women who are achieving extraordinary things by creating a new normal and realising their dreams. One minute we're living the dream up in this beautiful place with this amazing view and we spent $130,000 renovating, we loved it and then gone. I think that that, it's all part of a really slow progression of growth. Because I got the cats out of the friggin' house when the house was on fire. I lost one of them under the pub and managed to get it back. We then moved in with the animals who we now don't talk to because of the cats. <laughs> The more that we've shared our story with other people, the more we realise that even though our trauma was different, our road to recovery actually is quite similar. The day of the fire, I was at work in Melbourne and my husband was here at home. He had rung to say, don't come home, there's a bit of smoke around. At the end of that call, there was someone yelling out to him, telling him to run for his life. It was uh, raining embers and dark. Just black, it was like midnight. The noise was horrendous. The fire got to about maybe 200 metres away on the ridge and um, the wind changed direction, so that was really lucky. All of us would, in a heartbeat, turn back the clock and have that day not occur. But it's from that that you look at what's around you and you make a choice. And if your vision is to live in a, a safe and happy and healthy community, then as a community, we need to walk together um, into, into our future and create our future. I can see a bigger picture now without feeling like I'm in the middle of that picture and vulnerable. I think it's taught us all to be a little bit more tolerant, a little bit more compassionate and just general kindness. I think there's a lot more tolerance for if people just are acting in an unhinged way or whatever and you go, well, you know, it was pretty shit what happened to us all. Everyone likes to think, you know, we'll be normal, but there isn't really a normal anymore. We didn't know for days and days whether our house had gone. We kind of were, we had this old hippie van that was way overinsured. And so my daydream was that old Babs would have burnt down <laughs> and the house would be miraculously there, but of course it wasn't. After the fire, we had no idea what it was like outside our property. We tried to find out um, information on uh, just simple things like electricity or fuel or what was available. The Red Cross actually guided us through some of the things that we needed to do. After the fires, I'd drop them off at school and then it would be off to the material aid centre, just gathering practical items that we needed. It's amazing how you, much you rely on your stuff, especially when you've got little kids. And so if we hadn't have had people thinking for us, it would have been much harder. One of the most beautiful things about material aid centres was the opportunity, you know, to see people who you hadn't seen. Nearly two months later, I was introduced through a set of circumstances to Jemima, and we we both agreed um, on the principle that if you look after the women, by extension, you look after their families and the rest of the community. So we looked at um, you know a whole range of different things that would mean that they could just come along and be in a safe space talk with other women who would um, validate their journey and to be able to share their story in a way that they haven't been able to with other people. Riding that wave of, of the, the shit stuff, the good stuff, the friendships, the sad mm -hmm. stuff, the new trees being planted. People ask us why we started Firefoxes and how it came about and one of the main reasons it was pretty evident it was needed was because that men and women handle the trauma very differently. And neither way is right or wrong, it's just that it's different. So we realised that by supporting the women in the way that they needed the support, that we had a really great shot of supporting our community to get back on its feet. I've met a lot of people through Firefoxes. That's been really important, you know, other women. I don't know, we just seem to know everyone now.
somehow. And that's been such a massive positive thing because before that we felt really isolated in our little house with our non-sleeping baby. We've seen the difference that Firefox has had in our community because it's connected people who would not normally be connected. It's brought people together that would never have crossed paths before. And it's even helped bring down some of the barriers that have occurred in our, in our community. Reconnecting is critical. It's critical to knowing who, who is your community now? Or what do I do next? Um, what are you doing next? Well, knowing what you're doing next will help me figure out what I might do next. Connection for the community is vital because you don't want to be alone. Not that you don't want to be alone, but you can't be. It's to the, what has, has happened in, in any tragedy is tremendous. It's too huge for you to comprehend. Feeling like you belong and yet you're feeling connected, my goodness, the, the, we, I think we underestimate that until it happens. We underestimate it completely. We were all traumatised after this experience and that played out in a whole range of different ways with different people. Uh, personally, for me, it was bushfire brain, which is closely related to baby brain. So it's kind of the fog that appears. You can't multitask anymore. You can't get the words out that you used to get out. Uh, apart from that, there were some uh, other really bizarre things that happened. Uh, changes in my appetite, libido. Um, you know, we, we saw a baby boom in King Lake, but we also heard from loads and loads of people who hadn't had any sex for a very, very long time because they weren't connecting with their partners. I know a lot of people have said that it's been really hard on their relationship and a lot of relationships have, have fallen over. And I certainly had concerns early days. I thought, how, how's this going to go exactly? But for us, it, it solidified everything. And because we had so much junk to sort out, we actually for the for the first time re realised that we deal with things the same way and fundamentally we think about things the same way and have the same values and so it actually solidified everything we did because for the first time in nearly 15 years we're on the same page. For a lot of people the significant things that were happening before uh, the bushfires didn't feel so significant anymore. It truly isn't that important to me anymore. Like, sure, we'd all like to be fabulous and look fabulous and whatever, but it honestly is so much less important. Looking back at it now, the symptoms of, you know, the adrenaline pumping through the body for months on end, the intolerance for little things that weren't, of an, you know, such of an issue anymore, um, the appetite changes, the sleeping patterns changing, looking at people through different eyes all of a sudden, I now realise and I fully understand that was a result of being traumatised by the experience that I had gone through and the whole of our community had gone through. I felt really empty and that people didn't understand. Yeah. You know, I'm standing there looking normal. Normal. Yeah. Normal. Yes. But yeah. not normal that you've broken inside. inside. Yeah. Yeah. It's just <coughs> loss of grief. Yeah, it is grief. Lost, lost grief. It's lost. there is. And yeah. people don't understand what grief is because it can be lots of things. Yeah. The grieving, um, I, don't, I don't think that that really gets fueled. I think that's a void that's always there. The people that you can talk to about what happened are those that went through it. Every single person will have a different response. There's no sliding scale of how people should experience trauma. It's really important to talk about the little little ones, I reckon, because as our friend says, if he had two dollars for every time some fucker said to him, oh, Don was only two when the fire happened, he won't remember it. And it's such bullshit. One day once we'd finally moved into Smith's Gully after these millions of moves, we'd bought her a painting easel and Indy was painting. And she said, can I do some painting now, please, mummy? So she's about two and a half at this stage. This is months after. And I said, yeah, sure, darling. And she said, you'll have to get me out the new paints. I can't use my old paints because they burnt down along with our house. And I went, right, so you, you registered all of this. So she knew it all burnt down and she hadn't said anything. And then everything was burning down. And not long before that, because we before we got into the house, she had stopped speaking for two weeks. It was horrible. So when everything started burning down, we took it to the child psychologist and um, it, we, they were fantastic. 
we tried to make life as normal as possible. So we definitely, we always had a really um, strong nighttime sort of rhythm, so we stuck to that. We tried to keep her connections to her little friends as strong as they could and just making use of the services like the child psychologist, which was a free service through the bushfire um, stuff. And all of that stuff that's been organised, I, I think, has been really brilliant. You know, there's been some amazing psychological help for people and um, so for Indy it's been really, really useful. Hello Mum. Hey me. The girls and I were struggling for the first few months after the fires and when I say struggling I mean we really weren't listening to each other. I thought I don't know what to do but I knew there was a person who would know and that was an old teacher and she said to buy some shaving foam and some paints just squeeze them all out on the table they were then five and six years old and they just started meshing all the paints and the shaving foam together and started making all different sorts of colors that messy play was that moment to finally stop all those weeks later my kids were one and three at the time of the fires and um, they slept through a lot of the, um, the really intense stuff and what I came to recognise was that their experience of the bushfires was actually about the stories that I was telling them. So I was really careful about um, making sure there were messages of hope in there and that they had some control over that recovery themselves. If you don't help you and even if helping you is just simply acknowledging the fact that you need help and asking for it. But if you don't help you, no one else will. It's so easy to lose yourself when you're involved in a tragedy of this magnitude, where you want to go out and you want to look after other people and you want to get life back to normal. But you can't do that stuff really well unless you're on track and you're looking after yourself because you'll burn out really quickly and your road to recovery will be much slower. What would happen if you it's stopped? A tiny thing to take. So we're all, we're all mega, mega busy. We've, we've all sort of said that. We have lots to fill our time with. What would happen if, if you stopped for a week? I don't know, but I'm too tired to find out. When you've got all these incredibly important, almost life crucial things to choose from, you don't think about, oh, I'll book in and have a reflexology session so that I'm feeling quite okay and I can do these things or whatever the session might be. And if we had done that, if I had done it, um, my, my recovery would have, been, would have been different. It's okay now, but I had to learn the hard way. I think also another important element is to accept the help. Um, if you can find people who can help you out along the way, um, because that's part of their journey as well, um, accept it with open arms. You are the most amazing bunch of women. I, I don't know how you had time to sleep. Obviously you didn't. <laughs> I don't know about what you did. It's like, you know, you're on so many committees. That's why I'm surprised you're here. I'd be in a coma in my room. <laughs> People were saying, look after yourself. So taking minerals and vitamins and your... And the adrenals only get, get you so far. Yeah. <laughs> and so does the wine or, yeah. you know, going to the movies <laughs> or, or or having a, you know, a massage or going for a walk um, and exercising. That's all fantastic. But it's not the same as actually tipping back in to your heart and soul so you can keep on giving it out. So doing things... Doing things that connected us with people who gave us energy and support. Mm -hmm. Doing the things that uh, made sure that our mental health was in mental check. Health. Um, and making sure that... And emotional health, that yeah. comes from the emotional state, not just, um, it's here, it's this stuff. It's the... It's what, you know, the the fear and the anxiety and the... Not um, wanting the to talk about what the inner monologue is saying and all those yeah. sort of things. And you can only do that by tapping into to some emotional care and that's in different forms for different people from, you know, kinesiology to reflexology to all the different Chinese medicines and those sorts of things can be really beneficial for a lot of people. So it can take away some anxiety which we sort of have in our day-to-day -day life or daily stresses or anything and it sort of warms and soothes our soul. To seek help is the best thing. People like to think they don't need it. I'm strong enough and I don't need it and no one's going to tell me what to do. However, there's lots of help available and if it just means you know having massage for a little while why not I think you've got to find something that 
suits you. I went and spoke to a psychiatrist. I did uh, couples therapy. And uh, I also did um, like rapid eye therapy movement. I'm not quite sure what it's called. And I thought that kind of therapy for me worked the best. For some people it's, it is simply about, I just want to have a meal that I don't have to cook and I want to hang out with good people. <laughs> people who make me laugh, people who I can cry with, people who I can swap stories with, people who give me energy at a time when I feel really zapped of energy. In the early, like early days, like the first couple of days when we were allowed back after the fines, you had to fill in a whole lot of paperwork. And I can remember being told that day, look you will get a caseworker but you're not first line priority. Somehow, probably because I was disconnected from the community and I wasn't persistent, um, we got lost in the bureaucracy of it all and never got allocated caseworker until I finally got to the point at work where I lost the plot. Um, I took a mobile phone outside and placed a call and basically said, someone needs to sort this shit out now because I'm done. Um, and then bang, had a caseworker. <laughs> A case manager is fantastic because they're a personal assistant for your brain when your brain is offline, your brain somewhere else. If you can have someone externally come in and ask you lots of questions and then that can help ignite those parts of your brain which are, are not as loaded as they should be. It's important that there are agencies and other support networks that come in from outside a community to support them and help them because sometimes Go communities aren't in a position to make those decisions because they are so traumatised and also because they don't know what they don't know. So bring the expertise in and let them see the big picture. While you have a post-traumatic brain that is not registering information clearly or succinctly, it can be very difficult to one, find the time to make yourself stop to read information and two, cognitively take that in. So if you haven't got a, a, a phone that is data compatible with emails, get one. Get one. It will be the best investment you make because you're able to send and receive immediate information. Immediate. I went through a very steep learning curve with the insurance company where I had um, what I thought were very clear conversations about what I could expect from the insurance company. Know your policy inside and out because they're often really nebulously written and on purpose um, but there's also a lot of things in there that they just can't get out of but they'll tell you that they can and do everything in writing. And she said to me, you're, fight, you're still fighting your insurance claim. I said, yeah, and she said, you're the third person today who's come in and said that. And I had no idea that there was still quite a lot of people. Yeah. And that's another reason why I say stay connected, because I feel like I'm reasonably connected, mm. but I would love to, to know and meet yeah, more of these yeah. people, because we can't all keep fighting these battles ourselves. My first advice, don't talk to your insurer, other than to say that you would like all of your communications via email, please. One, it helps with you having more time to deal with other stuff. Two, it lets you be able to have those clear, concise conversations with your insurance or bank when you are ready. And thirdly, most importantly, is that there will be a record of your communications and recording communications had with insurance companies is so absolutely critical to following up any problems that people may have with their insurance company or their bank. I'm probably foolish in thinking this, but perhaps the government will actually intervene and put some uh, systems in place so that A, people understand the insurance they're buying, but B, so that the insurance companies need to be a little bit more responsible about the products they sell. In small communities, you can't afford to be divided. The system that was supposed to help us come together as a community and recover as a community systematically divided the community. If you can keep people talking so that they know people's story and understand people's situations, it's a lot harder for them to be, well, why did they get that? Or, or, or why shouldn't I be upset? I've lost things too. Differences between um, 
who's had funding, who hasn't had funding, who's had a great case manager, who hasn't had a great case manager, who's got insurance, who doesn't have insurance. No, they don't. You know, they think because I'm not named, right? You know, yeah. John didn't die in the first one. Well, you're right. We hear the same stories. It's were you there on the day of the fire or not? Were you caught in the floods or were you not caught in the floods? Did were you lose your house? Did you not lose did your you house? Did you not? Did someone in your family die? die? Didn't you? Yeah. It's, it doesn't matter what the trauma is. If we can talk about that and talk about ways that um, we can bring the community together rather than divide, I think that our recoveries will be much faster. Divisions created in the community can be avoided by having more open and honest conversations about what are your needs specifically and about helping and supporting each other. We recognise now, many, many months on, that part of that division was a part of the trauma process and part of dealing our way through that when we had no way of knowing what we were actually going through at the time. So given time, that process of division has started to heal, but that comes from having the ability to um, to listen to each other, to leave the egos at the door, to, to have some respect and, and honouring someone else's journey in what they're going through and to not make assumptions, to actually give them the time to tell their story. There was like a sort of a, a sliding scale of how well or badly you should feel or you know what I mean? Like, oh, I, think that's I just lost my house, but yeah, you know, the I lost system my house. systematically but... divided us, I think, yeah. 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 yeah, like I lost yeah. my house, but um, mm. I didn't lose anyone, so I'm allowed to feel this much sadness and go that crazy. And those people didn't lose their house, but they did lose some animals, so they can only go this, you know, like... But society should only be like that. Yeah. yeah. standing in the supermarket going, I can't decide what flavour of ice cream to choose. Mm. You know, it's just, and it, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, but, but that's what actually happened. Mm. But it's just that feeling, that feeling of being paralysed. Bushfire brain makes some really strange choices. Definitely does not think clearly. My memory um, was gone for such long periods. I couldn't tell you what I had for dinner the day before. I couldn't possibly tell you where I was two days ago. I just, I've, I've had like girlfriends have taken shopping for a whole day, like, and yeah. knew what you know. Some of the things were on the list, and like from shops open at ten and close at six, and I come home with nothing. Your mind's kind of in a huge daze, and it, everything is terribly difficult to do. And your reasoning, I think, is just not there. Um, I knew that I was uber stressed and uber busy and uber exhausted, but I didn't really realise quite how badly I was until I stopped. Now I look back and I'm like, I can't believe that I made decisions in some respects. I can't believe the people around me allowed me to, but they probably didn't know what else to do with me because I look back and think I was just not in a place to be making these kind of decisions. If I could have my time again, I would say the one thing to everyone is delay any decisions you can afford to. If you can financially freeze things and put things on hold so that you don't have to make a decision, don't. Because you are traumatised, you probably don't think you're traumatised, but you are. We can have a great community, but to do that, it is about rebuilding the people from their emotional core up and it's encouraging that to happen, it's saying it's okay to do that. It's about getting together, it's about connecting each other. So it's doing events that bring the community together. All of our, our programs, all of our events, they're all driven by what the community says that they want or need to be able to get healthy and happy and well again. If you want to write any uh, suggestions for future events, um, please use the pens and the paper on the table. Sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming out and another round of applause for everybody here. Thank you. And what we'd hope that the legacy that Firefoxes leaves is that a passion within people in the community to strive towards something that's healthy and something that um, acknowledges the past but is moving forward. Yeah. And something that, um, that whereby people are prepared to um, share that knowledge in order to make other people's journeys a little bit easier in the future. We need to give people hope for the future. 
because there is there but you've got to be able to see it see it's one and then tap into it is the next bit yeah. that is that is the key it's saying okay bugger it we'll give it a shot no harm can come from it and now we're going to do something that helps you breathe it makes you feel fabulous i think we should do it for like grumpy old women <laughs> I want to do this. <laughs>